This episode of the Jerry Paul Podcast is CME eligible. To claim credit, please go to the CME tab on jerrypal.org. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadero. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? We are delighted, absolutely delighted to welcome a husband and wife team today. We are welcoming back Bernie Lowe, who's a general internist and bioethicist and professor emeritus at UCSF, where he ran the program in medical ethics and is also past president of the Greenwall Foundation, which is a foundation dedicated to supporting bioethics research. And I was fortunate that Bernie is my mentor in that program. Bernie, we're delighted to welcome you back to the Jerry Pell podcast. Great to be here. And Lori Dornbrand, who's a geriatrician. She's a physician at Onlock at the IOA Center and the Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, which is PACE and has been there a long time, estimates she's done thousands, maybe three plus thousands years of night call. Um, and she's also a member of the- Nights, night, 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 night. only feels like years sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> 3,000 nights, what did I say years? Yeah, 3,000 nights. And is also a member of the California Coalition for Compassion and Care, a lot of C's in that, Pulsed Physicians Leadership Council. Lori, welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. Delighted to be here. So we got a, we got a lot to talk about today. This topic uh, came up with uh, Bernie uh, published an article in New England Journal called "Deciding for Patients Who Have Lost Decision Making Capacity: Finding Common Ground in Medical Ethics." We'll have a link to that article, but kind of stimulated this podcast where we're going to talk a little bit about advanced directives, durable power of attorney for healthcare, surrogate decision making, and the like. But before we do, we always have a song request. Who has the song request for Alex? Bernie. Bernie. I asked Alex to do Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now, uh, particularly the last verse, uh, but I think it's all very relevant to trying to think of what you'd be like, you'll be like in the future. Mm -hmm. And Joni Mitchell is an amazing story who she had a stroke, she had to relearn how to play the guitar, she's been performing recently. And this song is particularly poignant when she sings it, given her perspective. Rows and flows of angel hair And ice cream castles in the air And feathered canyons everywhere I've looked at clouds that way but now they only block the sun They rain and snow on everyone So many things I would have done But clouds got in my way I've looked at clouds from both sides now From up and down And still somehow it's clouds illusions I recall I really don't know clouds At all That was lovely. Thank you. Very That's apropos of the subject at hand. Very apropos. That's my Hawaiianized version and opening tuning because I'm still playing with two fingers because I'm recovering from a broken head. But <laughs> thank you for that choice, Bernie. Terrific. Thank you for playing it. Bernie, I'm going to take a big step back. Why are you interested in this as a subject? You write about this. You've written this New England Journal article. You've written past articles. I remember there was a archives article from, or annals. I forget. It was probably called the archives back then, resuscitating advanced directives. What's the thing that makes you interested in this? Well, decisions near the end of life for people who can't make the decisions themselves, they're common and they're really hard. And each case is a little different. Each patient is different. But the rules that sort of shape how we make decisions, what's allowed, what's not allowed, have really changed uh, since when I started, uh, shortly before the Cruzan ruling, to today. We've really gone 180 degrees on a lot of issues. And I think 
what strikes me is that change is possible, that Supreme Court rulings that are very unpopular don't always hold sway and can be overturned by research, by states acting, and by good clinical judgment. And, this is, and when you say that, are you suggesting this is applicable more to advanced directives around Supreme Court rulings? I think that the Supreme Court is not the final world. It's the final world on constitutional appeals, but legislation can change, clinical practice can change. But I think what we'll talk about today is how we're now opening the door to conversations rather than legal rules and documents. And I think that's where we want to be. And I'd love to talk about the history, but before I do, I'm going to ask you the same question, Lori. What interests you about this topic? What interests me about this topic is seeing it in my daily life and wrestling through these decisions with patients. And the classic case that we often hear of is the poor old person who got a whole lot of medical treatment they wouldn't have wanted, an ICU flog. And the cases that uh, haunt me are people who didn't get treatment, simple treatment like IV fluids and antibiotics that they would have wanted because someone had written comfort care in their chart. And for years, I've been struggling with how do we document this in the record and what information can we communicate and work with better? Yeah. And I think that highlights the complexity of this because it requires things like documentation. Bernie's bringing up Supreme Court rulings. We're talking about communication, which is challenging by itself and the whole medical inertia that happens. I'm wondering if we just take a step back. I'm going to go to you, Bernie, on this. You know, you say things change over a, a period of time. Like going back to, you know, even probably before the 1970s, I mean, most of these decisions were made, you know, end of life decisions, paternalistic by physicians. And that, uh, that changed, right? In 1969, I think the first advanced directive was created by uh, Lewis Kuttner. Well, there is a time when doctors made these decisions. If they didn't do it all by themselves, they talked to the family, and it was a conversation. But also, there wasn't a whole lot that doctors can do then. ICU care was pretty rudimentary, yeah. and now ICU care has flourished, and we can keep people alive in the sense that their heart is beating and we can sustain their ventilation and circulation. But the question is, is this really for the good of the patient? And is this what the patient would have wanted? Uh, you know, almost all deaths in the ICU now are due to withdrawal of care or withholding of care. Uh, they're not due to people dying despite maximal effort. Yeah. And it, and it just highlights the fact that, you know, these laws and the mechanisms that we have around documentation kind of grew up along with an increasing need for that because we have these interventions that can keep people alive. And sometimes people don't want that, including not by artificial means or I think what was initially described as heroic measures. But I think um, we, we also put families in very difficult yeah. situations because they're faced with withdrawing, withholding, and it's something they haven't been prepared for. Yeah. They haven't really thought about with the person they're deciding for. And sort of talking about that in advance, I, I love the Susan Block questions, which were in um, Gawande's Being Mortal. How much are you willing to go through for a a chance at staying alive and what level of being alive is acceptable to you. And I found that when I can step back, talk to the family about what was this person like, or what, if it's someone I know what I remember about them, and if it's someone I don't know, tell me about them. Yeah. And that helps us get to the decision. I once had a patient in the ICU at Moffitt who had had a stroke and was facing and not recovered, going to a nursing home with a feeding tube. And she had always been like immaculately dressed. And for some obscure reason, the hospital gift shop had a display of straw hats. 
And I had noticed it when I went in to see her and I was talking to her daughter. I said, you know, did you see those straw hats? I saw one that reminded me of her. And she said, I think I know the one you mean. And I said, the one with the leopard print band, right? And all of a sudden, it became crystal clear to her that her mother would not let, want the life that she was facing in a nursing home with a feeding tube drooling down her Johnny and being very helpless. And it's that kind of reflection and understanding and thinking about patients, who they are, that I want to see more of. And Laurie, for this patient, were you the outpatient provider? Uh, yeah, I was. she was an on-lock patient, and I went in to see her in the hospital. So probably a very uncommon circumstance where an outpatient provider who's had this conversation, who's known the individual for a very long time, actually goes to the ICU, communicates with the family, and potentially communicates with the you know, ICU providers about who this person is, what's important to them. While I love the story, I don't think it's probably very common in, well, it's certainly it not common in my It practice. doesn't have to be a visit, though. For example, I had another patient in the ICU who, she was on a ventilator, she had a respiratory arrest, and the nurse was really distraught. They don't want to treat this poor woman's pneumonia. And I pointed out to the advanced directive information that we sent in with him in which she said she was ready to go. She wanted her daughter. She wanted to do whatever made her daughter comfortable. So So let me, let me inject in here a minute, because I think these are really important points. And I would just add to the two questions. What would you be willing to go through for what, and you have to specify for what, and how long would you want us to continue if you're not improving? Third question is, and how should we make that decision? And that's where a lot of times, if a lot of patients who I've followed for decades in primary care say, I want the family to talk to you, and I want you to recommend it to them. That's really hard to do just because under our hospital system, and a lot of people don't have a doctor who's known the very long. Let me say, however, that I've been very impressed with how some of the younger doctors, particularly those with palliative care training, can have these conversations with people they haven't met before, but over a couple of days in the ICU, get to know the family, get to know the patient, and have the family trust them and latch on to these, what was that person like? And then there's always that projection, knowing what the patient's like, what do we think would be best or what would he want now? And sometimes you can't say, you really can't say. And that communication is important. I think that we should now be focusing even more than we do on how do you talk to patients, families in the moment when you can't talk to them? Because that's what it's going to come down to more and more. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, I mean, I want to make sure we get to what do we, what should we be doing now? But, Bernie, the first question I asked you was about the history of advanced directive, advanced care planning, durable found attorney. Can you give me kind of a, a little overview of that? We've mentioned Cruzan, Karen Ann Quinlan often comes up. Right. If, if you had to give a short history of advanced directives, advanced care planning, what would that short history look like? A very short history is that when we were first confronted as hospitals and physicians with life-sustaining technology that was unprecedented, whether it's ventilators or whether it's a silastic feeding tube, hospitals said, we want some legal protection. If we're going to discontinue treatment that's keeping the patient alive, even though the family wants it and seems to be sincere and loving, how do we know we're not going to get in trouble? And that's what started this whole movement for documentation. Did the patient really give explicit consent to a family member to make a decision that involves stopping something that's sustaining life? So I think some of this is concerns about legal liability. The other thing I think that's really important is that there are laws now in at least 41 out of the 50 states who give us a default list of who makes decisions. Even if you haven't completed a healthcare proxy, durable power returning for healthcare, most states say, here's a list of people who can make that decision in order. 
And the problem, and that all goes down in many states to close family members, any friend who knows the patient. So you don't have to have the piece of paper that says, I point so-and-so, only if you want to go outside the legal of the default characterizations. Yeah. But you have to have a, a legal document. So it's, you know, initially it, it started with living wills back in the early 1970s, the development of durable power of attorneys for healthcare. You also mentioned in your New England Journal article, you know, the importance about Nancy Cruzan, about that Supreme Court case. Why, why was that case so important or was it? Well, it was important because the Supreme Court probably more so in theirs those days, but even now, that's the final constitutional arbiter. And when they say there is nothing in the Constitution that presents a state like Missouri from saying we're an explicitly pro-life state and we will not allow even a loving family member to withdraw or withhold life-sustaining treatment without legal documentation or a very explicit oral directive from the patient that says, if I'm in this situation, i.e. persistent vegetative state, I don't want a feeding tube continued. States are free under the Constitution, according to that ruling, to hold those strict standards. Other states are free to have different standards, of course. So they didn't set, the Supreme Court didn't set the standard. They said basically that every state has the right to set their own standards. And it could be very strict the way Missouri did. Or potentially very loose. Right. Yeah. Many states have gone on to say you can appoint a proxy in an oral discussion with your physician. You can say, I'm going to the hospital. I want you to know, Doc, that if I can't make decisions, I want you to turn to so-and-so. And And now, the vast majority of states have default order of surrogates where if you don't appoint anybody, the following people have the authority to make decisions on your behalf going down the list. So we've gone back from the strict legal requirements just because they are unworkable. I believe both of you were practicing during the HIV AIDS epidemic Mm -hmm. in San Francisco. I wonder if you could talk about what practicing was like then and the issues that were relevant to this discussion about surrogate decision-making at that time. And so, so Alex, it was horrible. It was a time when many people knew good friends who had died of HIV AIDS And that was the time before there were antivirals. People would present with horrible opportunistic infections, not just pneumocystis pneumonia, but CNS infections with toxoplasmosis. And people had seen, and wasting syndrome, of course, people had seen close friends die from that. And they said, I don't want that to happen to me. Moreover, they said, I don't want my biological family to be making decisions because they either don't know I'm, I'm, I'm gay, they have resented my lifestyle, and they have, I've been estranged from them. So that was the poster child for advanced directives. And in fact, I and others did a study that showed that most HIV positive men, if you talk to them in the clinic, said, now, I want to talk to my doctor about end of life treatment and have very specific preferences. And they knew what they were talking about and they had very specific, specific preferences, not just for what they wanted or didn't want, but who should make decisions. So that was the ideal case for advanced directives. But it was a very unusual case because they could predict what was going to happen to them. It was you know, they weren't then ending up in a car accident and dying in a car accident. Uh, so there is a role for formal legal documents, but now I think uh, we should shift the focus more to having these conversations because there are always things we can do. With ECMO, you know, you can be kept alive for very, very long periods of time. And Lori... From your perspective, practicing as a geriatrician, how have you noticed 
the, I mean, this is a wonderful topic because it brings together ethics, health, the law, and the shifting laws, ethics, norms, practice. How has your practice been affected by these shifting currents over your practice lifetime? I think less so than what Bernie's describing. I didn't see very many AIDS patients because they didn't come up in geriatrics very much. But I think what was important about that was the importance of an advanced directive is when you want to designate somebody other than what would be assumed, which is usually a hierarchy of family members. And we see that too in geriatrics. And also the tension between the daughter who's on scene and the son who's on the other side of the country and family members sweeping in who don't really know, insisting on stuff being done. And, you know, the same thing, children can be estranged. So I think we're very conscious of the importance of identifying the appropriate decision maker. And then we have people without families. And what happens in that case? Is there a friend? Is there somebody else? Those are the things that come up for us. And also trying to get people to be explicit with their decision makers. Often they will pick the child who speaks English better. Or maybe in a Chinese family, it'll be the eldest son, even though there's a daughter-in-law who knows the person much better. Trying to assess who's the best source of information about what the person would want, and also trying to get them to communicate with each other about those issues. Laurie, can I interject here? So you mentioned that you've had thousands of nights on call. So I've overheard thousands of nights on call, not all of them. But I've also heard what you do. So you get on the phone and you talk to all the family members explain the situation, talk them through, reminisce about the patient. And then you talk to the person on the other coast sometimes. A lot of effort going into that. How practical is that now for people uh, to have those kinds of conversations? And how important is it to have those conversations? I don't think it's very difficult to make a phone call. Um, and usually, you know, you can, you can usually handle this pretty efficiently <laughs> and, and they can be crucial. I, it does I actually, require more work. And Laurie, I think what I the do think there's was, something unique both about Unlock as a PACE program yeah. and about you as a physician and what you do. I mean, I, I don't think we should understate how, you know, the decision to call these people in the middle of the night. Uh, Bernie, I think Bernie's exaggerating the multiple phone <laughs> calls. Um, there's usually a key person. And I think the most important thing you can do as a primary is identify who the key person is yeah. for the person in the hospital to be in touch with and give them whatever knowledge you have about the person. I mean, what I see... There is a lot of disjunction between inpatient and outpatient teams. And whatever you can do to bridge that gap, either by information that you send in or that you relay to them about, this is the person who knows who knows the patient the best. So let if me I, flip it around. Alex and Eric, both of you attend in, in geriatrics. I think probably you've been hospitalist at some point in your life. You do palliative care uh, consultations. How feasible is it for the inpatient team who's there, somebody's there 24-7, to have these conversations with a patient they've never met, hopefully with some input from a doctor who knows them, but sometimes just cold? How feasible is it to have these conversations? You know, Bernie, as you were talking earlier and praising the generations of doctors today who have training in palliative care and able to have these complex communications uh, with family members, including forming a relationship really quickly with them, getting to know their loved one who's now seriously ill, who they may not have met before they were seriously ill and had a chance to get to know. And I would say that this is the area where we need to make more progress. And that is when we are consulted in the ICU, it's not infrequent that the ICU team hasn't gone through the record to identify who the surrogate is, who the signed surrogate is, and who are the people who know the patient best. 
and what sort of conversations did they have previously about this, and then taking the next step to reach out to them. One of the major services our team provides, and this is largely done by Ann Kelly, who's a social worker on our team and has been on the podcast multiple times. You should see her sweating on the 300th episode, Hot Wings episode, um, Hot Ones episode. Uh, but she often does this, and it's just that ICU team is so grateful to have a hand-delivered paper copy of their advanced directive, which they didn't see, to have the phone number for the surrogate and explanation about the complex family dynamics that have led to this point and who are the people who are assigned, and they may be different from who the people who know the patient best. And, you know, things may have been evolved since that advanced directive was completed. And keeping family in touch about things, about the current conditions as they're progressing, you know, are the hope for goals being achieved or are we falling short of them? That, I would say, is the next area in which I'd hope we'd make progress with the current group of physicians in training. Eric, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I feel like a lot of value that we provide as a palliative care consult service is to do that legwork. And, and honestly, the ICU teams, the medicine teams, they are overloaded sometimes with patients. They're busy. They're doing a lot of different things. I know as a, when I used to do wards, I was a terrible palliative care attending when I was also the ward attending. And it gives us the opportunity to, because we have more time in palliative care to, to focus on this those things. I do think that you know some of the basics, like making sure that we're updating the surrogate um, if in which require us to find the surrogate is, is vital and something that we should educate folks about. I mean, it gets to the bigger question. Like me and Alex have had multiple podcasts on the the value of advanced care planning, the value of advanced directives. And I do think we're also throwing out some mixed messages out there about the value of these things versus newer approaches, serious illness communication, which also just feels like a rebranding of advanced care planning to me. And even with your New England Journal article, Bernie, you know, there is this, this idea that we're moving farther away from the legal documentation of these issues to more of a communication-based approach. But also, we've mentioned multiple times where that advanced directive, even during this conversation where that advanced directive actually played a, an important role, oh, this is the document that says that this is your surrogate decision maker. This was documented in their advanced directives as far as their wishes. I wonder from both of you, when we think about this tension between legal documentation and advanced care planning being a process focused around communication, is there a middle ground between that or are we really just, like, is this pendulum no, swinging no, no. back I and think, forth? Well, the pendulum does swing. The ideal thing, which doesn't always take place, obviously, is that it's all one process, that you start asking someone to talk about a pulse form, or perhaps recommending that if you want so-and-so to make your decision, you might want to do it more efficient, efficiently, because that's not the way most people would do it. But when you fill out that form, that's a time for a conversation to talk with the surrogate as well as the patient, what would you want, what would you not want? And it's a good chance to ask those questions that Lori raised at the beginning. What would you be willing to go through for what end purpose and for how long? And I always ask the leeway question. So I've heard you say that you would like da 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 da. Do I have that right? How much leeway would you give so and so who you've just said is your surrogate if they think doing that? is no longer possible or not in your best interest? Do you want them to follow what you say literally? Or do you be willing to give them some discretion to do what they think is best in the situation that you might not have anticipated? So I think if you have those conversations, document in the chart, and hopefully someone can find it in the chart, you know, I usually used to I used to put it under allergies because people always look for the allergies. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the other thing is then you can refer back to them when you're having a later conversation when the decision actually has to be made. Now, as I understand it, you and Dr. Widera talked in clinic about 
this and that. Can you fill me in on what that conversation was about and what was said so that you refer back when you're actually having to make the decision that's not sort of hypothetical future? Think back to that. And then you can always ask, yeah. and has anything important changed since then? Either the medical condition or the patient's goals or sense of who he or she is. They are. So you you, you want to yeah. tie the whole thing together. I, I want to get back to what you said, Eric, about yeah. trying to get this information communicated, which I think is a huge problem. I mean, I can think of several patients in whom I'd written wonderful notes, but they were buried somewhere where people couldn't find them or didn't see them. Or people uh, keep their advance directive in their safe or with their lawyer. Well, I have... A couple in the ideal world, I'd have an elevator speech for every patient that are describing who they are and kind of what their general goals are. But and then I, I want to get back to the pulsed because the pulsed historically <laughs> was a wonderful advance because years ago, and this is a big change I've seen, people had DNR orders. You know, there was the old out of hospital DNR, and yep. um those were wildly extrapolated. I remember a nurse calling me once for Chinese hospital and saying, I know so-and-so was DNR, but his systolic blood pressure is 60. And when and apologized for calling me, I said, yes, he's DNR, but I want to know. Um, and so then we got the pulse. So when and you're saying extrapolated, you're saying people are coming up with goals and values based DNR, on a simple medical DNR order. became overinterpreted as do not treat. Yeah. And um, then... Then the pulse came along, and that was great because there was a distinction between full-out cardiac arrest, no pulse, no respiration, and intensity of care in situations short of that. The problem is the pulse has become even more seriously overinterpreted. And that's that's one of my problems with the whole comfort care designation, which I think a lot of people choose that without really understanding the ramifications. And a lot of people don't, and a lot of clinicians don't know how to interpret the answer. Like there was something in Bernie's paper that struck me. It said empirical studies, however, show that pulse forms may not work as intended. In one study, 38% of patients who had pulse orders for selective additional interventions or comfort measures only were, were nevertheless admitted to an intensive care unit. And my comment on that is when they checked off comfort care, they might not have really understood what comfort care meant. So yeah. the way I've gotten around that, I mean, I think we tried to add something in the last version that is, is not a substitute for advanced care discussions. It's, you know, basically the post is really for um, first responders. What do you do when there's no time to ask or discuss? But then it's, you know, why do they have feeding tubes on there? That's not a that kind of discussion. Well, Oregon took um, it out, right? I think was it Oregon or Washington, Alex? And and actually, they did Washington, uh, Oregon. We Washington. argued about that with the revision, and one very wise person said it's sort of a proxy for how they feel about intensity. But which is the I, problem with DNR, right? It's sure. it's hard to make a proxy out of something yeah. that is just a medical order. What I have taken to doing is using those lines under the limited treatment and putting in a goal of a goal which is able to um, enjoy music and participate in activities at the nursing facilities or whatever. And, and, and Laura, why, what's your issue with comfort? Uh, the Pulse in California says comfort-focused treatment. Other people say comfort care, like in the hospital that's used a lot. What's your issue with that? What, is, what does that mean? I mean, if somebody has sepsis or dehydration, if the goal is to assure a peaceful demise, those are pretty comfortable ways to die. On the other hand, if that's not the goal, if the person doesn't want a lot of, you know, ICU stuff, but still sees value in living, those are relatively easy to easily treated. When I see comfort care on a pulse, I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, and, and and it's a very different decision tree 
depending on what the goal and and the goal about treating reversible illness that we tried to put in with that got taken out. The big thing we did with the revision was add goal statements. And you should have heard the discussion about the full treatment, calling it aggressive medical care. I, f- I forget all the different adjectives that we but, went through. Because those full treatment include hospice and comfort focused medications and no, no, full treatment means the full ICU. No, uh, but full treatment should also include hospice. That, so well, you know, that's the problem with any label that we use. Yeah. But I think I think we tried to make it clear that that was talking about interventions. I mean, and, and, the, and the comfort care designation said it just says call directed to uh, maintaining comfort, which says nothing. It's basically primary goal of maximizing matter. comfort versus yeah. full treatment is primary goal of prolonging life by all medically effective means. Yeah, I, I guess the Let question is. Jump. Go ahead, Bernie. Let me jump in you, 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 on calls. Yes, palliative care does sometimes prolong life, so you're right about that. <laughs> but I don't think most people view it that way. <laughs> Let me try and give some big, high-level, big-picture points about Pulse. I think it's absolutely right. It's crucial for first responders because it's recognized. First responders understand it. When they see a Pulse, they are told to assume that if it says, do not resuscitate, don't resuscitate. And that's really helpful for the first responders. The pulse to me is valuable when you don't have time to discuss and you need to make a decision yeah. right in the instance. And I think DNR and transport to hospital are those kinds of things. Once you're in the emergency department, you usually have time to try and talk to a surrogate, family members, try and find out more information, clarify the medical situation. And when you can, you have to talk about it. One of the well, problems with... So Bernie, is- Bernie, but before you go there, does that... So we, we got a quote from Lori about, you know, why Pulse may not work because they're not always followed. But are they followed? Because the Pulse is just a medical order. Use an emergency. So the fact that somebody is being admitted to the ICU on comfort-focused care may not actually be a sign that the pulse doesn't work. It means that maybe it's working. People are actually having these discussions. And because it's a medical order, medical orders can change. Right. The pulse shouldn't rule anything except I don't have time to talk, so I'm going to have to assume the pulse holds. Yeah. A lot of people, they have a pulse from a while ago, and no one's updated to to figure out, is this still what the patient wants? Has the patient's situation changed dramatically so that they couldn't have imagined where they are now. Uh, the pulse is just a way of making decisions when you don't have time to talk to someone about what's going on yeah. and what would they want in that situation. And once you're in the emergency room, even if you've had to do a crash intubation, you can always talk and decide, is this what he didn't want it or not want it? And you can always withdraw intubation and give someone a, a palliative sedation if that's what the patient would have wanted and what's best for the patient. Well, can I ask another question about what the patient would have wanted? Because yeah. we yeah. know that it's very hard to figure out what the patient would want. Right. You got an idea of values, like what's important to yeah. people, what makes bring them joy during the day, all of those things that Lori talked about too, like the yeah. str- going back to the straw hat. But actually for a surrogate to, to guess... What a patient would want around a particular intervention is very, very challenging. And we also mentioned this is that people also change their mind over time. We're adaptable. It's a false premise that I'm not making decisions as a family member. I'm just saying what he would have wanted. So I don't need to go through some difficult decision making. I don't need to feel guilty. In fact, most surrogates understand that they're making the decision. And it's not just based on what the patient would have wanted, if that could even be known, but it's what's best for the patient at that time, given their medical situation, and given who they are at that time. And that includes changes that might have happened over the past couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of couple of years. The way I view Big this... responsibility, and that's why we now know that people who surrogates get depression, PTSD, anxiety after they make those decisions because it's a big responsibility. Yeah. And one of the things that 
prepare does and advanced care planning at its best can do is say, this is a big responsibility and it's going to be hard, but it's something important that you can do for someone whom you love very much. So prepare for your care, Rebecca Sidori, really preparing surrogates to make these decisions uh, when the time comes. Laura, you were going to say something? Yeah, I think that's why I like to have emphasize that these discussions should be not in medical terms. Do you want this? Do you want that? Do the other? And even when you have discussions with surrogates, what are the goals? What does the patient want? I mean, because if I know, if I have a good sense of what their life is like, what's important to them, and how much they're willing to go through to maintain that, then I can say, we could do this and there's a small chance it will help, or we could do this, and there's a good chance it'll help, maybe we should try it, or even if we do this, it's unlikely, then you're not putting the onus of the decision on the, on the family. You're, you're, well, at least you're making a goal directed decision. You're helping them to make a goal directed decision. A lot of times families say, I want to do what the doctor does. I want the doctor to decide. And to which I say, fine, but for the doctor to decide, they really need to know who this person is, or that's the right way to make the decision. Lori, I want to make sure, when we were talking beforehand, you had an analogy you wanted to um, convey to our listeners, something about a rocking chair. Oh, yeah. I sort of view these conversations as sitting back in the... on the on the porch in in Kentucky, looking out at the uh, scenery and talking about what's important in life. I mean, have a discussion that's not laden with "I got to fill in this form." You know, what's important? You know, hey, who are you? How's your life going? What's been going well for you? What's not going well? What do you think? You know, that's what I mean by a rocking chair discussion. Mm-hmm. I love that analogy. And for our listeners who don't know, Lori was a country doctor in Appalachia and probably sat on the rocking chair having those kind of conversations with patients. Eric, how do you want to wrap this up before I uh, do a little bit more both sides now? All right. My, My last question to both of you is, we've talked about how we got here over time. And Bernie, your New England Journal paper talked about how, you know, these decisions and how we make these decisions evolve over time. And we see that with advanced care planning, advanced directives. We, we struggle with them still. And I hear from Lori, this is much more about, you know, the conversation dictates the documentation, not the other way around. So the Pulse is not your conversation guide. It is your documentation of the conversation. Is that a reasonable summary, Lori? Good way of putting it, yeah. Yeah. I wonder, yeah. where do you see this involving in the next five or ten years to both of you? What's next? Well, I think forms and laws will continue to evolve. I think that there's always a back and forth in post. And some, you know, there's a lot of diversity in states. And some states like like, like Washington, Oregon are Xing things out of the post because they don't find it helpful. People don't understand it. And it's, it, it, it's really confusing and misleading. I think... We're going to have changes and that people are going to realize that surrogates and doctors are, in fact, taking responsibilities for these decisions. The doctors may be guiding it, but they're guiding it in very ways that run along long tracks. And that's probably the way it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And that's not such a bad thing as long as the doctor doesn't project onto the patient or the surrogate isn't saying... I can't believe he would do this because that's just so wrong and you yeah. can't do it that way. I think we need to be more humble and say, I really don't know, but this is the best I can do given all I know about the patient, all I know about the situation. And I'm going to have to live with this. And all I can do is the best I can do. That's probably more realistic than saying, I'm certain this is what the patient wanted because that's what they they said, I hope the law continues to allow flexibility in individualism. One of the most awful things about the Cruzan decision was the, judge, the ruling, state ruling saying 
No one doubts that the Cruzans are a very loving family who want only the best for the patient. Nonetheless, we cannot make policy based on this family. We have to think about all the rotten families there are in Missouri and protect patients against them. Now, you, you, you make clinical decisions based on the patient and family at, at hand. Yeah. Yeah, the lawyer arguing that for the state of Missouri was Ken Starr, who later <laughs> investigated uh, yeah. the Clintons around the Whitewater affair. He was the special prosecutor. Fun fact, Lori, how about you? Um, what do you see ahead? What are you concerned about? What's your hope for the future? I just see continued evolution. I hope that the medical record, electronic medical records make um, strides in capturing these kinds of discussions and making them accessible rather than you know, turning into checklists or uh, here's the polls. We, we've been working on our advanced directive page at Unlock, and I hope that records evolve to capture nuance in a readily accessible way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the best thing is the old-fashioned way of printing that note that summarizes beautifully yes. the conversation giving it to the family and the patient and say, keep a copy on your refrigerator, bring it to the emergency room because they'll never find it in the chart. Put it on your thumb drive and give it to the... That's an incredible stealth idea, though, of putting it in the allergies. (laughs) That doesn't work. Allergy to intubation. (laughs) Or... <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for joining us on this podcast. But before we do, Alex, you going to sing for us a little bit more? Tears and fears and feeling proud to say I love you right out loud. Dreams and schemes and circus crowds. I've looked at life that way But now old friends are acting strange They shake their heads, they say I've changed Well something's lost, but something's gained In living every day I've looked at life from both sides now From win and lose And still somehow It's life's illusions I recall I really don't know life At all Bernie, Laurie, thanks for joining us on this podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It was a lot lot of fun. (laughs) And to all of our listeners, thank you for your continued support. And we'd also like to thank all of our listeners who've donated more than $250, including... Dwayne Dobschutz, Frisch Brandt, My Lasting Letters, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Roseanne Leipzig, Elizabeth Chung, Emis Shimoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Martin, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, Himashu Mahotra, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Wolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, Bob Rixey, Patrick Lally, Annie Hargadon, Susan Nelson, and Sharon Brangman. Thank you all.